I welcome everyone back to the board meeting. Um, again, as a reminder and as a courtesy to everyone in the meeting, please, please mute your line um, if you are not speaking, okay? It is my pleasure to now turn the meeting over to President Choi and Provost Ramchand for a presentation highlighting the University of Missouri Columbia campus. Thank you, Creator Chairman and members of the board. It's a great pleasure to, on, to uh, host you at Columbia for this virtual meeting. And uh, I'm going to be uh, presenting together with our provost some highlights at the University of Missouri Columbia and uh, look forward to the fruitful discussion that will come at the end. So with that, let me put my presentation up. Uh, can you allow me to share? All right, very good. So let me start with uh, some very exciting news uh, in student success. And our students at the University of Missouri are graduating at rates that have not been reached before. And whether we're looking at all students, those Pell students who come to our university from the state of Missouri, or Black and African American students, we've hit our high, the highest in our history uh, for six year graduation rates. Also, for the four year graduation rates, we've had highs in all of those very important categories. But we're not done. We're not satisfied with where we are currently. For example, the six year graduation rate for all students is about 73%. We want to see that above 80. For Pell and African American Black students, the graduation rate is about 62%. All of those averages are higher than the national average. What we want to see is a reduction in the disparity between all students and Pell, as well as Black and African-American students. So we have some work to do. But we're very proud of the accomplishments of our students that were enabled by our faculty and staff to ensure that our students have student success. Here's a sampling of 10 graduates from the December ceremony, and our students pursue exciting careers in many disciplines in both government, industry, and some of them also become entrepreneurs starting out on their own. Many of our students pursue graduate and professional studies, and there are many students that also pursue service, service to the community through programs like Teach for America. Our students are also nationally competitive. Here's just a sampling of five students who receive national, in some cases, international awards for scholarship. Uh, they will be pursuing their education in Great Britain or in Italy. And we also have students that will be traveling for the first time using the Gilman Scholarship. This opportunity, the opportunity to learn from different culture is a key factor of creating graduates who become citizens who are very conversant with cultural matters as well as global issues. In terms of achieving excellence, the faculty members are the most central body in the university. They are the constant. Many of them start their career and end their career here, like Mark McIntosh, spending 40 and sometimes 50 years at the university. What distinguishes faculty members at research universities like the four universities that we have are the recognitions that they receive from their colleagues, from their peers, and those peers that, that, that are, are around throughout the world, throughout the world. Now I put here six individuals who receive highly prestigious and prestigious awards as measured by the AAU through academic analytics. But it's also very important to know that there are over 16,000 awards that are available for faculty members that are considered to be prestigious and highly prestigious that are tracked by AAU and academic analytics. We need to continue to bring in outstanding scholars who will elevate our 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 mission for growing research excellence at the university. So I'm gonna mention four particular faculty members. Carolyn Anderson joins us from University of Pittsburgh 
and she's been appointed as the Simon and Ella Brock Professor of Medicinal Chemistry. She has a joint appointment in Arts and Sciences and the School of Medicine. And her area of expertise ties in, as you can see from her quote, many of the unique capabilities at our university that is unmatched anywhere in the United States. And she has been very successful in extramural research grants, as you can see from more than $20 million in support as PI and as co-PI. Next up is Professor Brett Froliger, and Professor Froliger joins us from the Medical University of South Carolina, which is a major academic health center. And he does work using advanced MRIs to better understand the brain circuit that actually controls addiction, such as drug addiction. And his ability used to use the advanced instrumentations that are gonna be part of the Siemens Health and Neuro Alliance for Precision Health is gonna be critically important to advance the research that leads into translation. And as he indicates, in Missouri, addiction is a major problem, whether it is cigarette addiction or opioid addiction. And through the research that he'll be performing, it will have the broader impact of improving healthcare and improving health of Missourians in the state. Next up is Professor Joy Weaver Halsey, who is a member of the School of Natural Resources in Kapner, and she received her PhD from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And she does very innovative work looking at how the tick, tick-borne pathogens affect not only animals, but human in Missouri. She's also very interested in improving opportunities for women and underrepresented minorities to pursue degrees and careers in sciences. And so she'll be working very closely with our leaders, including Dr. Maurice Gibson in IDE to promote those values and best practices so that it can benefit the entire university. Last but not least is Professor Rob Fletcher, who joins us from University of Warwick in England. He's been hired as a professor of history, as well as the Kinder Institute professor of British history. And as you can see, his interest in British history ranges broadly. He is even an expert on locus. And his collaboration is not only with faculty members in history and the humanities, but also with those who are in our School of Agriculture and Natural Resources. This is a very important graph that I want to share with you. The theme that the Chair Chapman has identified is research excellence as a major theme for the university. And it's no surprise, we are a research university, we're a member of AAU. So I put on this slide and the table an indication of how we are doing over the past few years. What you see in red is what I'm gonna say is old phase one and phase two. And I'm gonna say old phase one, phase two, because that data had elements of the coding of the grants that were not accurate. So the team in research and the team in the provost office worked very diligently with all of the departments that had grants that were funded during those years. And the revised data is what you see in blue. And for the most recent fiscal year, the increase in phase one and phase two compared to the prior, compared to the same year, but using the old data is almost 30%. So there's a significant increase in the magnitude, but also as you can see from 2016 to 2020, there's an impressive growth, impressive growth in the very important measures that the AAU monitors. I also wanna talk about inclusive excellence. And this is also a, a very important focus for our university. And on the, on the left-hand side, you see the applicants as well as the admits from the year 2015, 2017, 2019, and most recently in 2020. 
I'm happy to report that in the applicants for Black and African American undergraduate students, both the admits and the applicants have risen significantly since 2017. And for Hispanic applicants and admits, we've also seen dramatic increases. Now, what you see on the right is a ranking of the top, top major research universities in the Midwest. From 2005 until 2020, it shows the percentage of Black and African American students as a function of years. What is impressive is the line in gold. That reflects Mizzou. So in 2020, out of these 14 universities, Mizzou ranked number one in percentage of African American Black undergraduate students. The university that's right below uh, Mizzou in 2020 is Michigan State. Now, we did have a dip after 2015, but we are now beginning to see, as you see on the uh, left-hand side, a continuing growth of underrepresented minority students at the university. Inclusive excellence in making progress for faculty hiring. On the, on the left, you see the percentage increase in Black and African-American tenure, tenure track faculty, all faculty, including uh, NTT, and underrepresented minority faculty for tenure, tenure track, and all. And so since 2016, we have seen, seen increases in all of these areas. Our work is not done. We need to improve. Like many universities, we are putting into place programs that will help attract and retain outstanding faculty. What you see on the right-hand side is data from 2018 that shows, that shows the percentage of Black and African-American faculty as a, as a population within the total population. And as you can see, we rank fifth out of those universities that I identified before. Obviously, we need to do more, but we are, we are making progress. So I want to share that with the board as well as the public. So with that, let me turn it over to our provost, Lata Ramchan, and she'll be talking about achieving excellence and the methods to do so. Thank you, President Choi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I know many of you are on campus, but if you're not, my background hopefully will give you a sense of how beautiful our campus is, even when it's uh, deep in snow. So, so continuing on this theme of investing in excellence, uh, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is really how are we growing excellence? How are we holding ourselves accountable? And really the, uh, the, the mechanism by which we're doing that is to use a data-informed approach as the president shared, use that to create a strategy and then invest based on that strategy. This next slide is a little busy, but I just wanted to share it with you to, to, to give you a sense of how we are using this data that the president has, has shared with you. So on the first column, you have the, the big goals that we have adopted and embraced, excellence in student success, research, inclusive excellence, fiscal uh, operations, planning, stewardship. And there's a bunch of metrics or KPIs associated with each of these big buckets. And we've tracked these, the performance along, you know, over time along these various dimensions. And as you can see, and maybe you can, maybe you can't, but the, the numbers certainly look uh, very encouraging, they're moving in the right direction. But that's not the reason I'm sharing this with you. Specifically, two things about this report card. We're using this report card to make decisions proactively. What do I mean by that? Let's take the first uh, uh, goal, excellence in student success. The four metrics that I have there are the, re the retention rate, the four and the six year graduation rates, and the career outcomes rate. So we recruit students, we wanna make sure they graduate on time, we wanna make sure they get jobs when they graduate. That is de the definition of student success. You know, when we were approving programs earlier today, Curator Winnicker rightly mentioned, programs have to be self-sustaining and they have to support our mission. You take that supporting our mission and unpack that, what that means is unless these programs 
can actually demonstrate performance along these dimensions, we cannot be doing that. Everything we do has to show performance along these dimensions. That also means that if there are programs that we currently have that are not performing on these levels, then we need to fix that or inactivate those programs. So student success and the data that's, uh, that's giving us measures of student success are not just in a, in a shelf in Jesse Hall, but they are actually being used all over campus. So the second thing about this report card is, this is the report card for all of campus but we have a similar report card for every college on campus. Every dean is accountable for the report card for their unit. Similarly, this data can then be disaggregated at the department level. Each department can track what they're doing when it comes to graduation rates for their majors. They can track their research expenditures. They can track their percentage of uh, un underrepresented minority faculty, students, performance of those students. So, this information is being used at a disaggregated level to measure performance and inform decisions in a proactive manner. So that's the first thing I wanted to share about this data. Next slide, please. And then I wanna talk about specifically about how we're using this in research, uh, student success and inclusive excellence. So the research dimension, our, our goal, if you looked at our 2018 strategic plan was to double research expenditures by 2024, double research expenditures. That's what I call a big, hairy, audacious goal. How are we doing that? First off, we need the data, but we need to make sure our recruitment, our retention, our development, our promotion every part of the research um, value chain speaks to this goal. So what do I mean by that? Specifically, the president spoke about our research faculty. Last year, we recruited 52 tenure track and about 90 non-tenure track faculty. Listed on the left are a few of the faculty that we recruited last year. And I'll tell you why I pulled up this list specifically. Professor Olga Baker, she was recruited at the professor level, senior level in otolaryngology, uh, came from SUNY, uh, came with experience from SUNY Buffalo, the University of Utah. And when Professor Baker came here, she transferred more than 1.5 million in grant funds. Similarly, Professor Shirwan, the second uh, picture uh, on that on the slide, professor in child health and MMI transferred more than 2 million in grant funds when he came uh, and started working here this year. Professor Japna Dhillan, a, a junior professor in NEP, Nutrition and Exercise Physiology, transferred more than 700,000 in funds when she came, as she came onto our campus. Our own Susan Reno, who was here as an NTT professor now on the tenure track, has more than 6 million in funds that she has generated. The reason I share that is Again, it's performance that the data shows us as opposed to expectations based on potential. In other words, we're looking for how are these faculty going to perform when they come here? A lot of the time, if it's junior faculty, the performance is yet to happen, it's potential. But to the extent we can make sure that all senior faculty recruitment is based on actual performance that can be moved to our campus when they come here. So can they actually transfer the funds that they list on their CV? So does that potential convert into performance? And the president has, has made a change in the way we're gonna recruit senior faculty, which will definitely make a change in those metrics going forward. The second thing about recruitment. So we have 12 colleges at Mizzou and we can decide for instance, that next year we are gonna recruit the best person in the nation in each of these colleges, recruit 12 new faculty, one in each college. Or we can say, let's identify areas of opportunity based on perhaps what the feds are funding in the next few years, based on what does the state of Missouri need for the next few years? What's going to make our students' success even better over the next few years? Let's identify target areas and let's recruit not one person in each field, but let's recruit a cluster of faculty who can work together and create a momentum or what I call a flywheel effect so that the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. 
And if you look at the faculty that I've listed here on the left, not only did they bring funds when, they, uh, when we recruited them, they transferred funds, but interestingly, and this was just, I didn't realize this when I was pulling up this list, every one of them is doing research in the area of infectious disease. And when you add that to our current faculty who are working in infectious disease and are funded by the NIH, you have the ability to create momentum in that area. And guess what? We're in the midst of a pandemic when everyone's thinking about infectious disease. It's an area ripe for funding by the feds. So that's a great area to invest in. So can we recruit faculty based on this concept of cluster hires? And the cluster can be in areas that we deem to be essential. It could be in the creativity and arts area. We have amazing faculty in uh, multimedia, in textile management, in digital literacy. So can we create these clusters and recruit faculty and do it based on national uh, recruitment policies, as opposed to I hire someone because I know them and they're my neighbor. Can we do national searches and then bring the best people here? Finally, of course, the standards for retention, development, and promotion have also to be based on performance, not just potential. When you go up for tenure, can we demonstrate that the faculty member has actually received, has been awarded a grant as opposed to applied for one. Do they have papers they've published as opposed to just submitted? So that's how the data is informing our strategy in terms of research. Next slide, please. Student success. What the data showed us was two things. One, like I said, retention graduation placement cannot just be something that sits in Jesse Hall. It has to be owned by every college, every department. So we are instituting what I call cascading layers of accountability. How are you performing on these dimensions? When we do program reviews through the Office of the Provost, that's something we look for in every program we review. And if it's not happening, we have to do something about it. Similarly, we have to be proactively using the data. What I mean by that is the following. If students are not graduating on time, let's say our goal is to graduate students in four, not more than six years, we cannot be reaching out to those students at the end of the sixth year, it's too late. We should be doing that in the middle of the fifth year and come up with a plan to help those students so that a year from now or a year from then they will graduate. And that's what I mean by proactive use of data. And the fact that these strategies are working, just one instance of that is shown on this table on the right, in the midst of a pandemic, thanks to our advisors and our faculty who proactively have made intervention a part of what they do daily. If you look at those numbers, the total number of enrolled courses at Mizzou has gone up between last spring and the spring, as well as the student credit hours. And this is at a time when you hear out there in the national media that students are deciding to drop out and take a year off. So again, kudos to our advisors and faculty. Have we, are we done with this? Of course not, we're not done with this, but this is, it, it looks like the strategy is working. Next slide, please. And then inclusive excellence. Again, the data showed us that we're doing well, but two areas that we need to do a better job in inclusive excellence. One is the pipeline is a big problem. The pipeline for recruiting students is a constraint, especially in the STEM areas. There aren't that many students to recruit from. So we use that data to create programs that will improve the pipeline. The MARC IMSD program is, um, is run by some faculty at Mizzou in the biomedical biological sciences who are doing an amazing job getting our undergraduate underrepresented students interested in STEM research so that they then apply to grad school if they do well in grad school, we have a postdoc program that we are investing in to recruit students who are underrepresented in those areas. And then we groom, mentor them so they can become, uh, they are eligible to be hired as faculty through our inclusive excellence funding program. So that's addressing the pipeline issue. And, and it has, you know, the early results are very compelling. The second thing we're doing is what we found through the data was even if we recruit faculty, a big challenge that we're facing is once they're here for a year or two, they get recruited away by other institutions who are willing to pay them significantly more than what they're getting paid here. So we need to address that. So we've now created 
a mentoring program, a coaching program, so that the faculty we recruit are able to do well and feel a sense of belonging. But we've also set aside funds that are going to be used to retain faculty who are getting coached by other institutions. And again, the early results are really uh, encouraging. And again, all this is being done by every department is working on a plan to address this. The, the recent award for the economics department is a case in point. Um, so again, to summarize, next slide, please. We are using the data. We are proactively using the data to recruit and to make decisions based on performance, not just potential. And the strategy really is focus. We can do almost anything, but we really cannot do everything. And if something's not working, we cannot be investing in that. We need to hold ourselves accountable and say, it's not working, let's stop doing that. Let's divest those programs that do not meet the standards of excellence and efficiency. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Provost Ramchand. Great, uh, great presentation. Uh, let me turn it back to Chair Chapman to ask if he or other members of the board have questions or comments. Well, thank you, um, Moon and Provost Ramchand. We really appreciate your leadership and and providing that very useful information to us. Um, board members, um, do you have any questions for President Choi or Provost Ramchand? Um, is Curator Holbrock, I was looking at your, your graduation rates, uh, which, uh, which are very impressive, and, and, and I support your goal to 80%. To follow up on that, um, can you give us any data as to, uh, of the 80, for the 73% that are graduating every year, um, what percentage of those students have a job, uh, are leaving to a job, and or graduate school, and or military? Um, pick it to whatever you... I, I, if there's a term three months out, two months out, six months out, give me an idea of, of our graduates and, and, and the job prospects. Well, the most recent data that we have, and uh, this, this is reported, that information is reported each year to the state. And it is, it is comprised of two very important metrics. One is called the knowledge rate, and the other is called the placement rate. And when we look at both of those numbers, all four universities do very well. And the most recent numbers that I recall from Jim Spain when we reported it is above 90% for Mizzou. Uh, Provost, am I correct? Yes, you are. In fact, um, the, uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. The, uh, I'm looking up the, my, pre my part of the presentation. It's in the outcomes rate that's on that report card. That's, that would be close enough to the to what you're trying to, to your question, uh, Curator Hoberock. So it's about 93.4%. Um, so conditional on the fact that they report the data, which is also above 90%, about 93% of our students are either going to grad school or finding jobs. Could you please um, forward that chart? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't read it. I was trying yeah. to read through it. It was too small and you were going through it too fast. I, I would just like yeah. to have it in my sure. records so I can answer questions. Thank you. Curator Holbrock, if you look in the chat section, Kathy Feltz provided the link to data for all universities in Missouri. Thank you. Yeah. All right, great question, Curator Holbrock. Any other questions from board members? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Hearing no more, no more questions. Um, once again, thank you, um, President Choi and, and Provost Ramchand for that for that discussion. Um, Steve Graham, I'd like to now turn it over to you um, for you to introduce the strategic theme discussion for today regarding advancing research. Steve Graham. Okay. Let me. Thank uh, you very much. I'm going to defer to the president who'll kick it off, and then I'll step in. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Chapman. Uh, Today's discussion in many ways for me is a watershed moment. It's a moment where we as a university system with four public research universities and one AAU member really reflects and asks, what is the value of research? What is the centrality of research in a research university? And how are we doing? What are the trends that we can identify? And 
If we are not measuring up to our expectations, what do we do? What are tools, investments that are needed? And so we're gonna talk about all of these issues. I'm gonna start off the discussions with, uh, with a few slides, turn it over to Steve Graham to talk about using measures that are important to evaluate faculty performance in hiring, tenure and promotion, workload, as well as post-tenure review. And then we'll turn it over to the provost and the vice chancellors for research to discuss how their universities are doing. We're gonna have plenty of time for questions, but as always, feel free to stop us in our presentation and ask questions or provide feedback. So with that, let me begin by sharing my slides. So as you can see from this slide, I have a few caveats, which is creative works in the arts and humanities are important. All great universities have arts and humanities faculty and students who pursue excellence in this area. And, uh, and so I want to make that very clear, but today's discussion is really focused on those disciplines in which extramural research grants are expected. And we are gonna be comparing ourselves to other universities using those metrics. First, the definition of research universities. The Carnegie Foundation classifies universities based on their primary focus. Mizzou and the three other universities are what we call doctoral research institutions. But within that category, there's also a distinction between the highest research category and high research category. So MU is in the first category and the three universities are in the second category. What do they look at in terms of the classifications for the doctoral institutions? It's really R&D expenditures, postdoctoral fellows, doctoral degrees awarded. So they look at the breadth of activities that constitute the research and graduate programs at a university. In addition, Mizzou is a member of the AAU and therefore we use additional measures to evaluate the performance of the institution, departments, as well as faculty. And they include R&D expenditures, again, postdoctoral fellows, doctoral degrees awarded, citations. The quality of the work is measured in many ways through citation. Are researchers, colleagues reading the work and citing it? Number of National Academy members and national honors and awards for faculty. And as I mentioned before, there are about 16,000 awards that are tracked by academic analytics for this purpose. So these are objective measures that are used by top universities to examine, evaluate performance. This is a chart that shows on the x-axis R&D exp expenditures per faculty in thousands, as you can see and the trend lines of scholarly output, scholarly books multiplied by a thousand and books per faculty, the faculty refers to the tenure, tenure track faculty, postdocs per faculty, PhD per faculty, citations per faculty, honors and awards and National Academy. It shows a high degree of correlation with research expenditures. There's also a high degree of correlation for student success outcomes. Those universities with higher research expenditures also see dramatic increases in graduation rate, as well as Pell enrollment rates, as you can see from this slide. So how are we doing? We're gonna take a look at the historical trend. We're in 1983, 1983, 1983 is when I started college, long time ago, but in 1983, 
Mizzou was ranked 63rd when it comes to the total R&D expenditure rank as measured by NSF, the herd data. In 2000, there's a bit of a slippage, but 63 to 66 is relatively stable. But between fiscal year 2000 to fiscal year 2018, we fell from 66 to 93. That is a dramatic fall. If you look at the other universities, it may have been more gradual when it comes to s and but with the exception of UMKC, each of our universities were doing better when it comes to our rank than in fiscal year 18. What this says is that we've lost market share. We're a company, we're not a company, but market share of the research and development that is being conducted by universities. What are the reasons? Well, I'm sure there are many reasons, but what I'm showing here, this is just an example for, Mizzou, for the UM system, is state support with fiscal year 2000 and fiscal year 18 with such a dramatic decline. What caused it? Various factors. But losing state support doesn't help. It reduces investments. State support adjusted for adjusted, real dollars adjusted fell dramatically, 45% during a 20 year period. We've lost faculty. Tenure, tenure track faculty was at 2304. And now in fiscal year 20, it's 1910. If you look at the number of students, they increased. So take a look at all students versus tenure, tenure track, and even all students, all students divided by total number of tenure, tenure track and NTT who are responsible for teaching. It's an increase. And that increase will result on average, higher teaching loads. I took Mizzou as an example and looked at the top universities, public universities that are ahead of Mizzou when it comes to, uh, these are AAU institutions that are ahead of Mizzou in terms of, in terms of their research performance. Oh, all with the exception of uh, University of Oregon, they are actually below us in that case. If you look at this, it indicates that out of the 63, 64 American AAU institutions during the period right after the, right before the recession and a period of 10 years after that, we are the second highest in terms of percent reduction in tenure, tenure track faculty. Now, if I were to see this information without the, na the names of the university, I would say the 12.9% and 10% are concerning, very concerning. But if I look at the total numbers, I'd much rather be at 2,400 faculty than 1128. We were going in the wrong direction when it comes to tenure, tenure track faculty. What else? Let's take a look at state and institutional support. How do you become that research powerhouse? What comes first? You do the outstanding research and then the research investments come in or do you make the investments that create, that catalyzes research. So I took a look at universities that are ahead of us and looked at the state support for R&D. This is what's reported to NSF Heard and institution support. Where does institution support come from? Variety of sources. State support, the state support for R&D, specific support, let's say, Department of Agriculture in the state, Department of Transportation provides support for the university to do research. Institution support can come in through various revenue sources. 
from tuition revenue, from state revenue, from philanthropy, variety of revenues. But as you can see, as you can see, we are not where we need to be in terms of making investments. So this is not just for Mizzou, it's for the other three universities too. So the message today is that we have seen with the new leaders that have joined the university, I believe all of the chancellors are new, all of the provosts I believe are new, and the vice chancellors are new in their position. So with the new leadership, with the dean support, with the faculty support, we have seen <clears throat> some, some very positive trends over the past few years. And I'm gonna show you that. Before we, I show you how we are doing, uh, let me share with you the importance of using objective measures to evaluate performance. And faculty performance is key. Faculty performance is what drives department performance, drives college performance and institution performance. So this is a, a table that was developed by Chris Riley Tillman. You may recall Chris Riley Tillman, Matt Martins and Kathy Felt Schmidtke. You may recall that they gave presentations like this last year and the year before because they developed these tools for the entire UM system. It shows the measures that are important for departments, for disciplines in which extramural grants are important. How the Mizzou department is doing compared to the national mean, AU Publix, and that comparison within the department. Chancellors, chancellors, have been asked by me as part of the as part of the performance evaluation to include data like academic analytics as a tool, not the only tool, as a tool in evaluations. So this is for a department. This is for a particular faculty member in that department. How's that faculty member doing? Well, let's take a look. Average yearly journal articles, 8.75, compared to the departmental average of three, national median, and AAU public median. Departmental average is pretty close to the AAU public median at the 50th percentile. This faculty member, as you can see in all of those categories, are exceeding the department average in a significant way. But this is one way to evaluate the performance of that faculty member and the previous slide performance of the department. And those are measures that at the institutional level, the AAU uses to evaluate University of Missouri, KU, UC Berkeley, Princeton, in terms of how they rank performance within the AAU. So what do we need to do? I believe very strongly that we need to grow revenue and to make strategic investments to continue to accelerate the positive trends that we've seen in the four universities. We also, as the, the provost mentioned, we can do anything, but we can't do everything. And I really believe in that motto. We can't be all things. We don't have the resources. How do we identify those programs that we're gonna make investments in, those programs that we're gonna divest? We have to increase the number of tenure, tenure track faculty and provide the cluster opportunity in areas in which federal agencies and other funding agencies have identified as priorities. Faculty members who are recruited at the senior level must must bring performance measures that support AAU, whether it's in research grants, journal articles, uh, performance and citations, books that they write and so forth. And we need to provide a level of support in instrument clusters, in new facilities, as well as proposal support. 
through the Office of Research. And it's at the bottom, but this is critically important. And we'll share, we'll share this with you when uh, Tom Spencer uh, makes the presentation. Increased salaries for high performing faculty and staff, because we have lost many faculty members because of our overall salary structure. And those who are performing mm -hmm. need to be recognized and rewarded. So before turning it over to Dr. Graham, want to emphasize that faculty performance is the key to any great university. And the faculty performance and research excellence, teaching excellence are keys, are keys. But we also need to ensure that the high standards that are identified in our rules and CRR for hiring, annual performance, tenure and promotion and post-tenure review are implemented. And we need to use national benchmarks as a tool, not the only tool, as a tool to inform our decisions. And that every single member of our university contributes, contributes to the success. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Graham. Thank you. It's really helpful to understand some of the rules that help guide our, when we make these tough decisions that you've heard President Choi talk about. So as one of the nation's leading research universities, the University of Missouri maintains high standards in its recruiting, promoting, and awarding tenure. And productivity in these scholarly activities is the most distinguishing characteristic about the University of Missouri system. It sets us apart from all other institutions in the state. So this includes research grants, publications, uh, programs that we start. All of these are expected of our faculty members in order to be recommended for promotion and tenure. What's critical is the department and division standards must also ensure that they adhere to the university-wide standards that set this high mark. So when we make a tenure decision, it's one of the most important decisions that the university makes. So each department should match their standards to the national peers, so many of the things that you heard the president talk about, whether it's an AAU institution or it's a research one or two, and use those nationally recognized merits, external funding, publications of prestigious journals, books, conference proceedings, et cetera. And the chairs and the deans and the committees have to make tough decisions to ensure that when we tenure someone, they are excellent in teaching and research. Critical for what we do to set those standards. Next slide. One of the other elements that we use to help guide us is the faculty workload policy. And because of the nature of faculty, different departments, they have different standards in terms of books or publications or research funding. So they set the standard for their research, teaching and service and what the expectations are for the faculty members. Key to that is the Dean and the Provost review and approve those standards. And the provost, as a senior academic official on the campus, really monitors the entire campus. As an example, the average instructional responsibility for tenure and tenure track faculty members is nine credit hours per semester. Keep in mind, this includes all forms of instruction, supervising dissertation theses, clinical supervision, research supervision, et cetera. Then we look at the teaching load and make sure for the individual faculty member that, that his or her work is aligned with the department standards, that is consistent with what the overall campus goal is for instructional expectations, and that their teaching load or research load is commensurate with their productivity. So in other words, research active faculty, we would expect them to have more release time to do their research, to get grants and work on publications, those that are less active researchers would do more quality teaching. And once again, I focus on the issue of quality teaching. The deans have to review these workload standards and make sure that the chairs do in fact enforce high accurate evaluations and set high standards. And the provost again monitors the work of the deans to ensure that it's happening campus-wide. At this point, all the campuses are 
will be, be reviewing their workload standards and report back out to the chancellors and the provosts to ensure that they are meeting these national standards and high expectations and using these national benchmarks to determine workload performance. Next slide. We also critical in this whole element is the review of faculty performance. And our guidance on reviews requires that annually all faculty are reviewed. During these annual reviews, the chairs to provide feedback and assessment and create an overall improvement plan if they identify weaknesses. They also can adjust the workload standards. So for example, if someone is really good in research and they can balance that to have more research, someone is really excellent teaching, they can balance that to give them more teaching. The critical thing is that if, if either the teaching or the research efforts are unsatisfactory, the overall ranking for that year should be unsatisfactory. We figure these are two critical elements and this faculty need to do well in both. Then at five year uh, segments, we review the annual evaluations of those five years and give them an overall evaluation. That's kind of referred to as post tenure review. And there they get a look at their entire body of work, their annual reviews and make a decision about their, whether they have an unsatisfactory or satisfactory performance. The, the post-tenure review guidelines are also designed to allow special recognition for faculty who have outstanding performance. So this is where we have to be sure that we're making the tough decisions that will make sure that our faculty meet the standards, whether they're AAU, Research One, or Research Two. Once again, using these national benchmarks that have been identified and are acceptable as a way we can measure our metrics. We have to make the tough and necessary decisions to make sure that our faculty are performing at or above their peer institutions. Okay, okay back to you, President Choi. You're on mute. The quick question, uh, Steve. President Troy, can I ask a question? It says yeah. you impose tenure review policies and practices must be. Does that imply we're not? No, we do have one? those. We have those standards set for post tenure review. Now I understand that when you say they must be comparable to peer AAU, are we comparable, or is that something that needs to be worked on? At this point, we do well in some areas, but I think we can do better. I think that, that the departments make some tough decisions, but, but we could do better and make tougher decisions in that respect. So if I may, if I may add, the policies themselves are comparable, but it's the execution of the policy to ensure that we are using the standards that we expect to ensure that faculty members are evaluated using let's say the national benchmarks for research and actively, uh, actively reviewing the teaching performance. So the policies and the CRR, CRR are are, do meet the comparable nature of our peer institution, but it's the execution that has to be worked on. Correct me if I'm wrong, but we just revised these when? How long ago? It wasn't that long ago. Uh, Steve, I think that was about five years ago. 2017. Yes, Curator Stillman's right. Can yeah, you... so, so prior to that, and, and I think it's important to point out, universities have a lag time, and, and you have a lag time in recruitment and professors, but prior to 2017, we were, my memory is, uh, basically had an old 1950s model that did not allow the tools that we need. <sighs> Policies like uh, CRR are always being evaluated to see if they meet the needs of the current situation. And so this is a topic that we're gonna be having with chancellors, provosts and vice chancellors as we review the three policies that Dr. Graham mentioned. And, uh, and we, will, we will discuss that with the board as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is Curator Lehman, I've got a question. Um, sure. So we do a, a five-year you know, review. Is there any reason why we wouldn't do it, maybe a three-year review? 
due to where we are to get, you know, because I, I feel like, uh, you know, lag time that was just mentioned and just, you know, we're needing to move quicker. Is there a reason why we wouldn't look at this quicker to try to move the whole machine forward quicker? I believe that when the policy was changed five years ago, as uh, as uh, Curator Steelman mentioned, they looked at the policies at other major universities and five years is a typical time. But please keep in mind that there is annual evaluation, annual evaluation of faculty as uh, is shown on the second bullet. And that is a, that is a time when there can be changes in, in the workload and changes in, in the, uh, let's say, uh, approaches that the department can use to make that faculty member more productive and more successful. And I understand that. I think that's a great point with the annual reviews. I'm thinking of more of the trend because if the trend is wrong over five years, it's probably wrong over three. And so I'm just wondering how to bend that curve a little quicker. Thank You're, you. That's a, that's a great point, Curator Lehman, and the annual reviews will indicate those trends, absolutely. I need a little help of clarification here in listening to everything that's been said. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna, a series of questions, just to see if my understanding is correct. We are below our AAU peers um, in most of the categories that we're using as a matrix. Is that correct? We need to improve in our metrics. Yes, that is true. In the metrics that are of importance to AAU. But in those metrics, we are ranking below the middle. Yes, that is true. Below the median. Uh -huh. Okay. And so my question becomes, and I thought I heard uh, uh, Steve say that the workload policies have been in, evaluated and that if those workload policies were met, that we would be where we needed to be on those AAU metrics. Did I understand that correctly? Are you asking me or Steve? Steve I'm asking yeah. if I understood, if I've got, if my understanding is correct. If he said that, let me answer for him. Ensuring that our faculty members, if we look at our, if we look at our, our faculty workload, yes, there are some faculty members who have capacity to teach more. But even meeting all of it is not going to create the kind of savings for the investments that are needed. We are about $100 million off on just institutional investment to support research. So it's a combination of many things. Does that help when we don't spend as much because we are meeting our capacity in teaching to invest somewhere else? Absolutely, absolutely. But to say that that would get us to where we need in the AAU is, I, is simply not correct. Okay, so let me, let me re-ask this because I'm, I'm, I'm more confused than I was. And okay. sometimes my mind is, is, is slow, especially uh, today. I'm trying to understand whether or not mm -hmm. the expectations that we have set for ourselves and for our faculty as, a, as an excellent performing uh, university in, 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 in totality and by campus, mm -hmm. that if we look at those expectations and then we look, if we go backwards and say, what is the workload that each chairman at each department is putting upon those faculty? If we, if every faculty member achieved that expectation, would the totality of that give us the position that we aspire to be? No. Okay. We Thank need. That, that, we, yeah. Okay. And we're okay. going to talk about that. Yeah. We need additional okay. faculty. We need additional investment in in salary increases so that we don't have our best faculty members being recruited by other top universities. We need research facilities, as well as the ability to seed large multi-investigator proposal development so that we can compete with those universities. So okay. by, what you mentioned by itself is not sufficient. That's right. Okay. 
So we have to we have to we have to change the expectations on the workload of our current faculty, and we have to invest more dollars and cents. And I and I'm with you on that, and I will do everything I can to, to get us there. But if I just look at the dollar and cents I have today, and the faculty I have today, and the workload expectations, if I what I thought I heard you say was that if every faculty member met those expectations, though we may not rank higher in the in the, in the AAU matrix, but we would come closer to our self-imposed or self-determined state of excellence. Is that a fair assessment of what I heard? Uh, let me try to, let me try, if I understand your question correctly, if we have all of our faculty members teaching to their capacity, the workload is meeting the capacity that we expect, I want to parse that out and say many of our faculty members are meeting it through their research and their teaching. Are there others that can contribute more in the teaching because their research activity is not as high as what we would expect. And that happens. That happens at all universities. But that in itself is not sufficient. Now, when we say we want our existing faculty members who are doing well, meeting the workload that they, they should have at an AAU institution in Mizzou, research to at the other universities, the answer to that is, that is not going to be the mechanisms that we pursue. The reason being is that they are at that level. What we need to do is provide them the support, provide them the support so they can be more successful, not by asking them to work harder, but given the investment so that they can be more successful. I, I, I understand that. I, I, I greatly understand that. In, in my world, those same principles uh, apply. Right. But also in, in my world, I know the following, and I'm going to assume this is going to be true of, uh, of academia world. You have professors and tenure track and uh, uh, professors that are blowing it out of the ballpark. They're standing up there every day and they are just blowing it out. They are doing great, great work. Um, and I commend those, the, those individuals for the contribution they're making and the workload they're carrying for this university. Mm -hmm. But in my world also, I have people that don't perform nearly as well. Sure. And, and I have to motivate them to perform well, and I have, to, I have to evaluate their performance, and I have to set those expectations to get higher performance from them. And at some point in time, I have to make a decision within my world as to whether or not that employee is, 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 has a future within an organization. So my question, my question is, and I'm going back to, to something that Le, uh, Je, uh, the Curator Lehman was, was, was alluding to, is our problem expectation? Is our is our, is our problem review? Um, you know, and 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 if we're reviewing, if I somewhere I picked up that our review process out of I, I forget where I picked this number up. Five hundred reviews, three hundred reviews. We had five that weren't satisfactory. I, I think, and if that is true, and our expectations and our outcome is not where we want it to be, to me. Just to me, one of two things is a problem here. One is it's either expectations or to the review process. Um, and, and I think it's important to understand that so that you can address whether it's an expectation problem and workload problem, or whether it is a review problem. And we have people that are skating on the reviews and getting good reviews and maybe they shouldn't get a good review. Uh, and then that's where I'm trying to go with this. And I'm not doing a very good job of it. No, no, no. I, I understand what you're saying. So universities also have mechanisms to address those situations. Now, when you when we expect that all universities should do a rigorous uh, review process before hiring, that's very important. And then once they are hired to provide the faculty members with the support that they need to succeed. But the annual reviews provide the opportunity to make corrections. In some cases, we have faculty members who start off on the tenure tenure track, but at the third year, at the third year, the department chair of the department may decide that this person, this particular individual is not 
meeting the expectation, at which point a terminal contract is provided. There are also mechanisms at the promotion and tenure. Promotion tenure is the most important decision that a university makes and therefore must be taken very seriously. So there are cases in all four universities, like other major universities, where there are denials of tenure. They're difficult decisions, but necessary decisions. Now, I wanna go back to what you said about, is it the expectation or the review? There are so many faculty members who, like you said, are just doing a fantastic job. Let them do their job. In fact, find ways to hire more faculty like them and support them. That's the important thing. But if there are those faculty members who can do more, who can do more in terms of their teaching because their research, their research is not being performed at a level that they used to be. It may happen for a lot of reasons, including funding areas in a particular field drying up. It may happen because there, there are situations where there's a lapse in funding and graduate students and postdocs are not available to work with that faculty. There are many reasons like that. But when their research does go down, the department chair will look at the needs of the department about courses that need to be taught, service engagement, and make the appropriate distribution of the workload. So that faculty member may teach more, in fact, should teach more and do a good job of, of teaching. So I, I believe what you're saying is, how do we ensure that everyone is contributing in that way and to make sure that they are performing, whether it's research or teaching at the level that we expect of our four universities? Yeah, yeah, that's ultimately what I, what, what I am getting to is, and I understand that, that, uh, that, that some prefer to teach, some prefer to do research. Um, some are doing research in areas, as you said, the funding is drying up, uh, the world has changed. Um, there are opportunities to do research and to publish and all that good stuff are, are getting narrower. And, and maybe it's time that, that their deans or their chairs start repurposing their, uh, their contribution and their workload. And, and, and that's what I'm driving at is, is that, are we sure and are we comfortable that the combination of workload and the combination of review is being done to the level that it's going to drive the excellence in education that we're striving to get to? And, the, and I understand there's all sorts of things that go to that, that, that excellence mark, and it's not just dollars of research, it's citations, it's articles, it's all those things combined, and I'm, I'm prepared to take all those into account. Sure. But I want to make sure the expectations are set and that the Reviews are done in such a way that those expectations are met. Well, absolutely. And we have, to, we have to have high expectations because we are research universities, high expectations for research, high expectations for teaching, and to ensure that we are using our valuable uh, faculty members' time to best achieve it. Now, each year, the provost and the deans do review, do review the workload distribution. All of the promotion and tenure come up to the provost all the way to the chancellor's level. So we do have a means of evaluating whether the uh, units, the department chair level and the dean's level are doing the jobs that they need to do to achieve it. And so that is something that we do uh, do on an annual basis, and we will share that information at a future meeting. Moon, this is Jeff Lehman again, and I, I, I want to make a comment because I'm, you know, to me, I'm honing in exactly where Kerry Hobrock is, but you obviously gave us a very sobering view of research, and we all know that, and we're all trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm very aware that there's multiple ways, things that we have to attack. Sure. But I'm going to go back to what he said. If it's true that only five of 300 um, faculty had uh, unsatisfactory marks in in research, uh, to me, again, I know that's not the only, that doesn't fix everything. But there, there, it seems, and I'm not the expert in this, but it seems like a clear disconnect to me. Sure. And so I'm not saying it fixes everything. 
sure. but that I just really have a hard time rectifying those two things as being true. Absolutely. And we are going to evaluate that very carefully. And that is why we, as part of our presentation, we included those items in there so that we review. And the question that we have is, are they sufficient? And that's something that we have to ask ourselves annually, because we do expect that we have to increase dramatically the research from where we are today. So you are absolutely right, Professor, uh, Curator Lehman. And Moon, to be clear, you know, obviously we're, we're trying to hire more talent, but, you know, it just, I would expect those people to be judged accurately. And I, I, that's what I just don't see. And, and Thank you. everyone deserves to be judged fairly and accurately. We owe it to, to, we owe it to the faculty, but we also owe it to the institution to the taxpayers that support us for the four universities, to the students that, and the parents that pay the uh, tuition. And we owe it to them that we have to seek excellence in research and student success. So yes, thank you. I know that I'm dominating this, but I wanna drop back to a slide you had up. I know it was the Mizzou Animal uh, Science was, yes. was an indicator. And then uh -huh. below that, you had one for a specific faculty member within that group. Is that right? That's that right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did I understand you correctly that there is a slide like that on every tenure and tenure track professor? Yes, we have that at Mizzou we do. Okay, we have that on every tenure and tenure track at Mizzou. Yeah. It, it's, right? it's in the, it's in the data. I hope some of the other chancellors are doing something similar to that. Let's just talk about Mizzou then. Yes. I'm gonna ask the toughest question. I'm gonna be about as blunt and as direct as yeah. I can. Unfortunately, that's the way I am. Right. I'm assuming that if I looked and, and, and the one you gave me, the one you put up there was a professor that was doing really, really good work. I don't know who it is, or maybe his name is on it. I don't know. And I thank you very much, whoever that person is. Uh -huh. I'm going to assume that there are some slides that are not quite that oh, of course. productive. Of course. Okay. Yeah. I am assuming that each faculty member has the opportunity to look at their little slide on that. Is that, is that correct? The the data is available to all of the department chairs and the deans and the faculty members can request to see it. And many faculty members have requested okay. to see that data. That's right. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage every faculty member to get that data and look at themselves and evaluate themselves or their peers. Mm -hmm. And I want every, I, I want what I would want and I can't direct anybody to do that, you know that, but as a curator, I can say, as a curator, I expect every dean and every chair to evaluate every one of those members and those that are, numbers that are coming below the standard that we are expecting mm -hmm. to start taking action and doing something about it. And that, that taking action does not mean termination. That's not what I'm suggesting. Taking action means bringing those standards up and bringing that performance level up to those expectations. Um, using data to measure faculty performance, like academic analytics is very important. There's no question about it. But the law of averages indicate that there are going to be some that are going to be above the average, some that are going to be below the average. But if they're below the average because in those metrics, because they are doing more teaching, they're making an important contribution to the university by allowing those that are more research active to pursue their research. So it is not just looking at those numbers that determine the value of that faculty member to the university. Now, having said that, having said that, if there are faculty members who are not contributing, they're not doing the research and they're not doing the teaching, absolutely we have to look into that matter and address it. And I expect that to start at the department chair level and the deans. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to ask a little broader question. First of all, I think, I think this has been an excellent discussion and I commend uh, you and Steve for, for bringing it forward. And we're talking about uh, the importance and the need, the, the absolute need to increase research. And we, mm -hmm. we keep using this ter term research. I would assume that not all research is the same and considered the same by those who have to, have to judge it. And I, I was interested earlier uh, in your comment that we need to stop investing in programs that do not achieve uh, excellence. And uh, 
when we talk about increasing research, are there strategic decisions that have to be made by you and others as to what research we're going to uh, emphasize? I shared when you mentioned this earlier too, I shared with you a couple of days ago that in an email that we can't, we can't be all things to all people. We just, we just can't, right. we can't do that. And uh, I know you mentioned that, uh, or maybe Steve mentioned that the university or Jonathan maybe mentioned that Utah just became a member of the uh, AAU. I wasn't aware of that, but for instance, they have a, a particular uh, person there, a Nobel prize winner who is the lead researcher in, uh, in uh, gene targeting. And do we have areas within Mizzou in which we can place emphasis on uh, and get more bang for the buck. I, I hate to use it that way because I, I don't mean that in a less than honorable way, but mm -hmm. to get more bang for the buck in, in the ratings. Yes, well, that's a great question. And that ability exists at all four universities. And what we have to look at carefully is where do we have currently, currently, areas of strength, trying to create new, trying to create uh, new clusters, new clusters in the area in which we are not strong in is not the right approach. So we have to figure out where do we have strength and where, and does that area of strength that we have also align with the priorities of the federal government in terms of funding? Federal research is a major component of overall total research at a university. And that it's the most important measure because of the correlation of all of the scholarly activities for AAU phase one. That's also important to the three other universities, federal research grants. So the answer is we have to identify where we currently have areas of strength and then make investments to get the critical core that's needed that's aligned to federal priorities to grow research. So it has to be targeted. And uh, that's what the provost mentioned in her previous presentation. If we have 12 colleges and we have 12 positions, it can't be each college gets a position. No. And that, that makes perfect sense. That makes you know, perfect it may sense. Very well be that three to four colleges may get more resources because they're able to identify the leaders in that cluster area to recruit. Well, may, I, may I add a, a sentence or two to this, sure. this is Mo? Mm -hmm. um, I think these points are, are, are well taken and uh, Marcy makes a great point. I, you know, SNT as a campus is an epitome of what we can do and what we cannot do. We are a tech centric, we are essentially an institute of technology. For us, there are really three areas of research clusters, if you will, you know, by that I mean the types of research. One is everything that we are very much focused on. You know, they, they sort of peer reviewed national funding organizations like NSF and NIH and DARPA and DITRA and DTEC and places like that. So we have to do better per faculty. And we have faculty members that are absolutely stellar when it comes to attracting those kinds of funding. But at the same time, we have faculty members that don't measure up if that is the only metric. But they do research at the 6.2, 6.3, 6.4 level. By that, I mean, they do solution inspired research, which is sort of application driven research. These are the types of work that, you know, they're not looking for the, you know, cutting edge research that NSF funds, but the types of research that the Army needs and the Air Force needs and those sort of things. I think we are focused on that as well. I submit that there is a third category that I believe our campus for sure and perhaps other other universities can benefit from putting focus on that. And that is really industry and foundations. The types of research that industry supports, they're not looking for, again, cutting edge research. They're not looking for the shiny object. 
they have they have needs, they have problems, and they they're looking for solutions to those problems. This is the exact conversation that we need to identify where are the areas that we need to invest in and where are the areas that we can let the faculty develop themselves. That is one of the reasons we are trying to develop this, you know, a manufacturing ecosystem because that's where a huge level of resources at industry exist and we need to be able to become a destination of choice for the small manufacturing companies in the state of Missouri so they know there is a place to go to get the answer to their solutions. But I think this is a, a, a great conversation to have. What are the areas that we need to focus on because we cannot be a, all things to everybody? And uh, as a part of a strategy, we here have focused on identifying the sort of application driven, you know, research that will boost our dollars. But I'll say this for the last sentence, our dollars aren't all the same color. You know, the types of research money that you need from NSF to boost your reputation is not the same types of research that, you know, a, a small manufacturing company will provide to you, but they are both critical to enhancing research and engaging all faculty, regardless of what tilt they may have. Mo, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because if you noticed, and I don't know what we all did, that on the one slide that uh, Moon showed earlier, the top two schools were engineering schools, Georgia Tech and AM. So that tells me that your school is perfectly positioned to uh, to take advantage of what we're talking about right now. That's and it. I applaud you for the work that you've already done in that area and continue to do. So I think it's a great opportunity. So I think uh, Chancellor Dagani gave us a nice segue into what the universities are doing and what are the uh, tools that they could use to help increase, increase research performance. So with that, let's go to our first presentation from Provost Latha Ramchan and Tom Spencer, who is the Interim Vice Chancellor for Research at Mizzou and Tom Spencer, We'll begin the presentation and we'll take it away from here. Tom. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I've had the pleasure to meet most of the curators in person. And it's really an honor to be able to present, present this report on uh, MU on behalf of the provost and myself. So just a few uh, select points of prize. Uh, at MU, we have a one Nobel Prize winner in the last couple of years. Uh, we have a total of 10 or 11 members of the National Academies. I would like to point out only uh, two or three of them are actually active uh, as faculty members at this point, but we do have a history in terms of that. Uh, over the last uh, couple of years, we've really ramped up in terms of uh, fellows being named of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. You can see the new fellows here on the right. So we've had three elected in the last year and we have 41 total. We also have a lot of award winners in the creative arts and other scholarly pursuits, such as Pulitzer Prize, Guggenheim Fellowships, and Fulbright Faculty Fellowships. I won't go through the total R&D and federal R&D expenditures because we've already discussed that, but we do, we do have some strengths in terms of those areas with respect to the system. So just observations are that we have a reduction in total R&D expenditures uh, over the last uh, 16 years, or sorry, 22. We have a reduction in state support, reduction in tenure, tenure track faculty. We have higher student to faculty uh, ratios. We have a declining rank in faculty salaries, particularly you can see in the table here uh, at all uh, ranks. If you compare fiscal year 04 to fiscal year 18, uh, over those period of 14 years, uh, we were ranked uh, very low among R1 uh, institutions in each category. So these trends must be reversed to really achieve research excellence. Next slide, please. Well, we have uh, made some gains in this area. So we had two years of faculty and staff raises beginning in 2018. 
These are absolutely critical to retain high performing faculty and staff. And it's also necessary to attract and hire high performing faculty and staff. And so we have made some gains, but we need to continue to make investments in performance-based merit increases. And this needs to be done particularly uh, at all levels, but at the associate and full professor level to ensure that we retain them as high performing faculty. Next slide. We've also made some strategic investments in the research enterprise. All of you are intimately familiar with the Next Gen Precision Health Building and Initiative. Uh, we've taken advantage of system level and campus level investments in tier one, tier two, and tier three research and creative works investments. Many of these are actively yielding results in terms of a return on investment. We have new research centers being established in uh, influenza research, production of biomedical models, and data science, and radiopharmaceuticals. We've invested in instrumentation in terms of imaging, electron microscopy, and radiopharmaceuticals. We also are developing specific support mechanisms to enhance investigator research excellence in the Office of Research and Economic Development for large proposal writing support, broader impacts, and the creation of organized research units and clusters of excellence uh, with a hiring component to achieve growth, but achieve growth to achieve excellence because one can do one without the other, but you can achieve the last without the first. Next slide, please. So this highlights some of the strategic faculty cluster investments that are across uh, the university campus. That includes all the way from arts and sciences to the College of Agriculture, to vet med, uh, to the School of Medicine. And many of these individuals have been highlighted in presentations to you or by the Executive Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs. Next slide, please. We are seeing the return on these strategic investments. So you can see an increase uh, over the last six years in total R&D expenditures with a specific 29% increase since 2016. Yeah, next slide. But we need to continue this growth, growth trajectory so this slide shows you other AU member institutions. Many of these do not have a school of medicine. And so we are behind in terms of total R&D expenditures. And although we have an uptick in a positive trajectory of growth, this is not sufficient or necessary. We need to continue strategic investments to achieve research excellence and actually meet our aspirational goals of doubling research expenditures and research and scholarly creativity output, in addition being able to remain as a strong member of the AAU. Next slide. Okay, my turn. Um, thank you, thank you, Tom. And by the way, uh, the, the the information that the president shared about that one faculty member who was off the charts in terms of productivity, that was my colleague, Tom Spencer, who just talked to you. So, um, so we do have outstanding faculty on our campuses. Uh, I don't know if this helps, but this may help with some of the questions that I heard, which is we have workload policies, we have reviews, annual reviews, promotion reviews, post tenure reviews, and then we have the promotion process itself. And in both these areas, you can ask, are we enforcing the standards and are the standards sufficient? And everything here in green has already been completed or close to completion. So we are looking at all this more closely and I won't go into details. Uh, the question about, are, we, are our standards sufficient? Uh, and again, this is just my opinion. If you compare ourselves to other institutions, I don't think our standards are by any means insufficient. We can do, uh, we can certainly improve the mechanisms we have to enforce those standards and make it more contingent on actual performance as opposed to just effort. And that will help some. We can, for instance, think about workload in terms of are people teaching enough? Can they teach more? And that will also help but to the president's point, 
if you look at the magnitude of that, and I was just doing some really rough back of the envelope calculations, you know, we start with 500 people teaching and then how many are teaching the required load versus not, it comes down to about, at least on the MU campus, there's about 80 faculty that are what I would call squishy. And then you look in each one of those cases, what is the reason? There's a very justifiable reason. They're doing some more research. They are, uh, they're teaching a class where the enrollment was not sufficient to make the, uh, to, to reach the 180 uh, credits that they need. So there's a little bit of, you know, how much can we actually get by really pushing that on, pushing on that pedal? I don't know that we can get much out of that. That is not to say that we should not be enforcing those mechanisms strongly enough. So we need to do a better job enforcing that. And, and we're actually in those conversations right now. So every dean in every college is looking at what are their workload requirements and are they doing just the bare minimum or are they aspiring to do more than that? What makes this even more interesting is in every institution you have, you, the mature, as an institution matures and as faculty mature, they come in as assist, assistance expectation is they do research and then they plateau out once they reach full professor, the research perhaps plateaus out. So then we ask them to teach more. And that works if we also have incentives to make them want to do that. If at the same time, our compensation is way below the national norms, the incentives we need to make that happen, we have very few degrees of freedom to make that happen. So that's just something to think about. So overall, I think we can do a better job with enforcing the mechanisms that we have to make sure that we are holding ourselves to our standards. But at the end of the day, unless we recruit faculty, unless, I mean, this institution, the number of tenure track faculty we have compared to the number of students we have, that needs to change. And that cannot be addressed by um, some of the things we've talked about. We really need more resources to address that. So with that, I will thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Can I ask a uh, quick question here? Sure. Yeah. sure. Um, when I was down at, uh, when I was on State Tax Board, they told us down there that uh, we could not give faculty a bonus, that that was illegal. Is that the same procedure, is that same policy apply to the University of Missouri? Um, go ahead, President Choi. Uh, I wouldn't call it a bonus, but if there are uh, retention increases, uh, even during years in which we have not had uh, a merit pool process, if there are faculty members who are doing very well and they're on the verge of being recruited by another university or maybe even have an offer from another university, we're, we're able to retain them by providing them an increase in their salaries. Mm -hmm. okay, that, that's an increase in salary, but we can't take a, a, a staff member that has done a blowout job for one or two years and say, hey, I, you know, I want to give you a bonus for your excellent work, a con you know, monetary compensation for that excellent work. Uh, that if that if that model exists, uh, we would love to explore it. <laughs> what, is <I> <laughs> meaning, what is more meaningful is the salary increase. That's what they compare in the AAU, for example, or AAUP. I'm sorry. But remember, we went we went through a whole exit with the state auditor's office on bonuses. We, that, I, we are restricted. Okay. I might jump in if you don't mind, President Choi. That we have lots of tools, uh, but bonuses are not one of them. Um, but there are ways that we can increase salaries and so forth, but um, it not a defined bonus for after the fact performance. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let me move on to the next person that's gonna speak. And I believe it is uh, Provost Jenny Lundgren and Vice Chancellor Chris Liu from UMKC, so. Thank you, President Choi. And on behalf of our, uh, Provost Lundgren, it is my great pleasure to give this overview about research enterprise of UMKC. And good afternoon, uh, board member. Well, I'm going to touch three areas. Where we are in terms of research, what kind of plan we're doing, and how are we going to implement it? Next, please. In order to understand 
where we are, we always like to compare with our peers in terms of the total research expenditure. Well, since our peers, some peers are performed too well, like Alabama, Birmingham, they are actually comparable to you to the University of Utah. <laughs> so our line looks like a flat, but I like to focus on here is since 2018, that's when the UMKC new 10 year strategic plan started. Our research expenditure grew 6.4 for the first year from 18 to 19. And that is below the average of the national. National average, it was 5.7. If we take a two years, two years in a row from 18 to FY20, UMKC uh, research expenditure actually grow 24%. Well, please remember during this uh, two years, our faculty actually dropped 14%. All right, well, the research volume is always well correlated to how many people are doing research. Look at for the UMKC, our active PI, it was only 114 for that year compared to UMB, which they have over almost uh, 800 active PI plus the supporting staff. So our number is small. That is the first observation about where we are in terms of research. Next slide, please. Well, UMKC is quite unique. We are the second public institution with medical school. In general, medical school contribute dramatically in terms of research expenditure. But look at this chart on the left. Uh, in Alabama, their medical school contribute almost 70%, but our medical school contribute 20%. Well, nothing wrong about it in terms of this comparison, but that is our uniqueness because our medical school is focused on teaching. We don't have a health, uh, we don't have health system. We don't have a hospital associated. Uh, well, next slide, please. This is another observation I like to highlight um, in order to understand our research culture. This is, I use the tool academic analytics. We try to understand how our researcher actually doing research. And this slide is showing each dots represent each faculty member. Whenever you see the cluster, which means they work together as a team. And this is, the, this is the overall about our 39 faculty member on STEM research, but there's only one which is circled in red. They work together involving with grants because that is connected by the green dash line. So in other words, our research are largely silo and not engage actively about research. So what are we going to do? What is our plan? Next slide, please particularly how are we going to transform the culture because we are urban research institution. Well, let me uh, stay back a little bit. When we dealing with research growth because we are working with the faculty, for faculty in order to change their behavior to re towards research always involve with three factors and they always ask three questions. What do I think? It, which means, do it, is the faculty really think doing research is positive for their career? Second question they always ask themselves is, do others, how, what do others think? Their peers, their colleague in the department or their colleague from other campuses, doing research is a positive thing or not? And finally, faculty member will ask themselves, can I do it? Which means, do we have a support? So the it is a right time for us, for UMKC to do it because, because of the pandemic. Last year, Chancellor Agrawar launched the UMKC Forward Initiative, which we are looking at how are we going to grow our research. So we identified the three area. We are going to take a close look in order to do our planning. First is the infrastructure, which means we are going to uh, use the infrastructure which invested from the system, for instance, the data center. And second is in terms of the service we can provide, which is the, uh, the research service. Can we provide anything which we are missing? For instance, the grant uh, developer, the grant writing, 
which right now we don't have. Number two is the faculty member. So we're using University of Utah model, which is called the matrix uh, mentoring model, which each faculty, particularly junior faculty, will be mentored by four tiers of mentor. So we are building our center for advancing faculty excellence. We're using that model to help them. And we also identify what is the cluster. Uh, next slide, please. The cluster will help us to excel and this slide is basically showing, based on the 10 year of data, which area, except medical, are our strengths in terms of research. So those circled, uh, highlighted, non-medical related. So those area, we are already strong. So our goal is how to find a link between those cluster working cross-discipline to promote more interdisciplinary research. Next slide, please. So in order to identify the, well, well, we already identified this, this strength, so we need to shift or transform the culture towards more research proactive. So we need to, we are, we are, we are setting expectations and put some incentive to help faculty to group work together to do more large scale, which will generate larger uh, research dollars. And we are also help faculty to build connection with the community partners. Because what is research? Research needs to solve the so social issues. So through those culture shift, we're going to identify the successful pockets and then the other faculty will follow suit. Next slide. So what kind of tools are we going to use? Well, there are a lot of tools. Thank for the system investment uh, a pivot Academic analytics are great tools for us to share with the faculty, not only about how they are doing in terms of performance, this is actually sharing with them what kind of uh, funding opportunities out there. Just give you one kind of like a uh, like insight. There are over almost 90,000 foundations, all kinds of foundations. There are a lot of dollars like uh, we're giving every year. So how are we going to even work more with our university advancement to target that pool of money? Next slide. So we are also exploring the, uh, how we can buy, well, give more dollars to let faculty to buy out their teaching time in order to devote it to the research. And how are we going to strategically invest like a grant writer who can help write non-technique portion to coordinate a larger scale of a proposal. All those are evidence-based and like you, uh, NC State are very successful of bring a lot of larger scale uh, proposals or grants back to their school. So this is where exploring the uh, feasibility. Next slide, please. So we, of course, we need some investment, but Based on our planning, we identified where we are going to make investment. And this is also part of the UMKC Forward Initiative. So we're going to invest at least the staff to emphasize, to emphasize our service. And we are going to build a research scale for faculty, particularly for them to write more competitive proposal through our faculty training workshop. And we're going to invest more dollars to buy faculty time out and finally, last slide. Not, okay. Um, well, we are we are working um, com uh, compactively with the uh, CRR in terms of faculty workload. But again, as everybody discussed previously, we are revisit our standards. We need to raise this. Well, raise the standards at. Uh, checking against our peers and we quantifying and aligning our new research expectation related to the review. Um, so our, it is our hope based on the new leadership, UMKC forward, we are confident to build UMKC as a hub that connects disparities parts of society. We're going to build UMKC as an anchor for regional and national communities. Thank you.
Could uh, could I heard you use yeah. the term UMKC forward four or five times? Um, can somebody give me just a quick overview of what UMKC forward entails? I don't need a long dissertation. I'm just trying to want to make sure I understand it a little bit. I would be happy to if I could uh, carry it over up. So last year after COVID struck, it became obvious to us here at UMKC that we cannot do business as usual as we face this whole barrage of upcoming financial and enrollment challenges. So in response, we launched UMKC Forward, which is a large campus-wide effort to reimagine and restructure our universities. So in the future, it is more attractive to students, uh, is financially stable, delivers an excellence in, in its mission of education, research, community service, and flourishes. So right now we struggle to survive, but we need to get beyond that to flourish. And so there's a lot of work still going on, but we're focusing on five anchor points and I'll do the 60 seconds on this. Number one is student success and connecting our undergraduate students to a professional schools so that we are known for our professional schools so that they're ready for well-paying jobs. So oftentimes the first degree doesn't get them there. Uh, so a concept that we're now calling professional mobility escalators and given that we're an urban population, for some, a lot of our students, these will also serve as social mobility escalators. We'll make investments in the professional development and support of our faculty through that cafe model that the provost is working on. Because without a strong faculty and strong support for them, we cannot deliver on uh, student success or research. Increase research and scholarship by our faculty and the students to be on par with the peers and actually exceed that median. Um, launch of talent link which is an effort to address the need for non-credit bearing certificates and badges uh, in the kc area they have about three hundred thousand uh, people here that have some college but no degree and they need to be ready for the job market and then community engagement through our students and here's how we're going to do it real quick how do we underwrite all of this uh, we have been talking about finances we currently have no access to new funds so we will do all of this by realigning and restructuring what we have. And this will involve program review, which is, uh, we've been doing right now, and unit restructuring, both academic and administrative, implementing efficiencies so that we can release funds from one area and effort from one area that can be redirected to support our efforts in the areas of focus. So lots going on. We're committed to this path now. Uh, we'll be rolling out more and more uh, of the details by mid-March, but um, we're excited, but we also realize this is the only way forward. You know, we talked a little bit about um, being on the right track. I know you saw the uh, rankings for UMKC in terms of research. They hadn't moved much over the past so many years. Well, in one way we can say, well, look, we did all right. But I tell you this, um, even if you're on the right track, if you sit, it, sit on it for too long, some train is gonna run you over. So we need to be moving, we need to be moving forward because everybody else is moving forward. So status quo is not acceptable. So we'll do our best to uh, move this forward as we go on. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Let's move on to uh, Missouri s and and we have Provost Stephen Roberts and Vice Chancellor Costa Satsoulis. And uh, let me get their presentation up here. All right. Good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be presenting for the first time to the Board of Curators. My name is Karsta Tsatsoulis, as the President uh, Choi mentioned. I, I wanted to start off with uh, a little bit about our uh, strategic goals. Um, our strategic goals are to aim for Carnegie R1 uh, to double our research expenditures by 2025. We're also interested to increase our campus PhD enrollment to go to 850 by 2025. Uh, last year, we're at 677. And also increase the number of graduates per faculty uh, per year to 0 0.75. That will put us in the top uh, 20 to 15% of research universities in the United States. Uh, on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see uh, our uh, research expenditures in millions of dollars. The bottom line is the federal, the red line is the total, and the top line is um, the NSF herd data. As President Choi mentioned before, and during his presentation, we have gone back and looked at what we have reported to herd, 
in 2019, and the green line is an increase of about five and a half million dollars, not the total percentage of what um, uh, Mizzou had, but for us it was uh, almost uh, 15%. Next slide, please. Uh, these are our, um, our peers. Um, they are mostly technological universities, and you can see where our research expenditures stand. Um, we need to do better. This was fiscal 19, uh, and I believe, as you will see uh, in our other slides, and even in this trajectory, uh, we are moving up, but not, in my opinion, uh, fast enough in terms of expenditures. Uh, we're better than Stevens and Illinois Tech, but we need to catch uh, other universities in the coming years. Next slide, please. Um, at the same time, uh, as uh, the, the president mentioned, research is, is not only for itself, uh, but it's also to produce um, scholarly outputs, to produce graduate students, to educate graduate students, not the graduate students, to improve our facilities and so on. So this information is a scholarly performance of Missouri S&T over different periods of time based on academic analytics that was mentioned before and how we compare in terms of scholarly performance with our, uh, with our peers. And as you can see, despite the fact that our research expenditures do not rank at the top, our scholarly performance is either second or third, and in some cases, extremely close to the top university. Uh, in other words, we have outstanding faculty who uh, produce excellent results. And some of them actually are in areas that don't even have uh, a graduate program, a lot of research. We have some uh, excellent faculty in history, for example. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, we, again, we need to compete with our peers, but I think in terms of scholarly performance, we're doing well and we can always, of course, do better. Next slide, please. Um, Research expenditures lag research awards. And I wanted to show you uh, research awards uh, in the last few years and the trajectory they have. These research awards are uh, both from federal as well as industry funds. As uh, Chancellor Degani mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, Missouri s and has a long tradition of working very closely with industry. Uh, we have strong partnerships in uh, our area, in the St. Louis area, in the Missouri, in the Kansas City area, and, and elsewhere. And um, we have had a tremendous success the last few years. Now, 2021 is a projection based on the first six months of awards. Uh, as uh, some commercials say, you know, past performance is not always a guarantee of future earnings, but I'm hoping that we will continue in this trajectory. Um, so some of these grants come in for three or four years and they come in as a single amount. Others are annual. So as we spend our funds, I believe that you will see an increase in our research expenditures following uh, lagging a little bit our research awards. Next slide, please. So, so Kostas, if I may say one word about this particular slide. So the research expenditures that you show in previous slides map into the research awards of up to 2018. That's correct. 37 million. Yes. So, uh, so we, you know, we are hoping that the uh, uh, next year and two and following years, the uh, expenditures will reflect the increase in the uh, awards that you're showing here. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, Chancellor Degani. Yes, as I mentioned, the uh, expenditures lag awards and um, it has been a little bit more challenging during the pandemic because of the uh, difficulty of uh, recruiting graduate students, travel restrictions, hiring uh, staff people, equipment. But uh, I've, I see that uh, just based on our awards, our expenditures would definitely grow in the years to come. Yes. Next slide, please. So the question is, how did we grow research? Um, first of all, it's very important to give kudos to the provost, to the chancellor, to the deans, to the chairs, because we change workload policies to balance research and teaching. Also, we have done an extensive research planning process to create something we call the research roadmap. The research roadmap is to look at where we're gonna go in research in the next 10 years, seven to 10 years, 
and identify current strengths and future research opportunities. We've actually, through this process, we have identified new areas and we are focusing a little bit on, on, uh, on agencies we had not had success in the past, specifically NIH, and we've, that has led to some successful NIH and CDC proposals. We've also organized a lot of workshops to inform and train our faculty, junior faculty especially, but also others, how to work with, with uh, agencies we haven't really worked in the past. Missouri s and has had a tremendous success with NSF, but we have workshops about how to work with industry, DOD and NIH and so on. So we now have been increasingly successful with career awards, DARPA Young Investigator Awards, awards to junior faculty. We've also built some strong relationship with DOD labs uh, down the street from us is the Fort Leonard Wood. So that relationships has led to $5.2 million in uh, traumatic brain injury, brain injury research. Um, we've also kind of pivoted our research centers and we encourage them and urge them to lead large interdisciplinary efforts which in the last two years has led to three NSF major research instrumentation grants, um, Department of Energy, Department of Defense grants for over 37 million. And uh, I think it was mentioned in another presentation, we're also increasing the number of research faculty and postdocs. In other words, uh, people who are 100% dedicated to research to grow it. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the uh, research in steel. So here are two of our stars, Ron O'Malley and Laura Bartlett. Together they have more than $31 million for research in next generation steel. And I'm amazed because steel is a 3000 year old alloy. And we have the mines and the facilities at s and to do something new with that. And I'm showing the stars, but the stars are not al uh, alone in the sky. They are a lot of other stars in the constellation of this research there are more than a dozen faculty from s and involved in this research, all of them stars, and also a lot of industry, because one of the requirements by the military is whatever we develop needs to be producible to serve the military. So this is an excellent example of pure research leading to a transitional product that serves both the civilian and the military applications. How are we gonna grow research? Infrastructure, faculty development and culture. I've heard that in other presentations as well. We're looking at the manufacturer Missouri ecosystem. We're looking to build on our successes in steel, but also in manufacturing, create a research and training hub. You also may have heard of the $300 million gift by the Mr. and Mrs. Kummer. This is going to be used in create a set college of innovation, entrepreneurship and economic development endowed professorship, research center directorships, hiring the people who are going to be catalysts, bring research funds and increase research funds. As I heard from Mizzou, the sum together, they will be greater than just their sum of, 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 of uh, success. We've also just named our Doshi Department of Chemical and Biochemical Engineering, which is a model for departmental culture. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we need to reach our goals? Increase faculty efficiency. We need to enforce workload policy and post tenure review. We need to have better efficiency in balancing teaching and research. We have a unique opportunity to use the Cummer gift to hire the best faculty and provide resources for them. And as you've heard from other presentations, we need to stabilize the number of our tenure and tenure track faculty. In just three years, we've gone down by about 13% from 310 to 271. So we need to grow that. And the last slide, I will let uh, Provost Roberts, if you want to say a few words about faculty workload. Sure, uh, and, and again, thank you Costas for that presentation and for that excellent overview of our research roadmap and strategy going forward. And uh, just to touch briefly on the management of faculty workload, uh, like all of the other campuses and universities in the system, our faculty workload is managed according to CRR 310080, tenured and tenure track faculty workload policy. Um, every department uh, has developed a workload policy that defines research, uh, research metrics and performance and, and, and it 
expected levels of productivity for a given research load. And then faculty are assigned teaching workloads that are inversely related to their research productivity. And this is evaluated and subject to change on an annual basis as part of the annual performance review. Currently, workload distributions for all of our faculty are currently being analyzed against department standards for effectiveness in teaching research and service. And those department standards are also being reviewed against university and UM system standards. And those specific to disciplines, since those standards uh, vary across uh, disciplines, they vary across the level of, of degrees that are granted by a particular department. So at, at Missouri s and we have departments that are uh, high flying, externally funded uh, research departments. Most of our engineer, all of our engineering program in natural sciences, for example, uh, award degrees all the way up to the PhD. And then we have other programs that award uh, degrees only at the undergraduate level. And there's, so there's disciplinary differences in the performance standards and there are, are uh, uh, degree-based differences in the performance standard as well. And I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding that. So any questions for Costas and Steve? So, during the past few years, the growth uh, that Missouri s and has seen is, is impressive. And uh, it's similar to the trends that we saw at Mizzou. And it's important to uh, continue to do the hard work that achieved it and accelerated. So. Yeah, I, this is Julia. I just wanted to add on that there is plenty of work to do, as you know, um, and we can't lose sight of that. But I also want to acknowledge that we have substantially turned things uh, around and started moving into a very positive direction. Um, and I think we, we, we talked a little bit about some of the policies that were put into effect in 2017. I feel like the board's been having the same conversation uh, for many years now. And I can affirmatively say having served on the board for uh, not quite five years, um, I think we've made a significant amount of progress in what would considered, be considered to be a short time in the world of academics. So having been from the corporate world myself, um, I know that things do move at a slightly different pace and I've been really uh, pleased and impressed that we've all been able to kind of link arms and move the needle in a positive direction. And um, there's more work to do, but I just wanna congratulate everyone for the significant positive progress that has been made. And I appreciate each one of your leadership um, and hope that you will continue to accelerate this positive progress. And it's hard, it's really hard. It's like herding cats, especially at a university, but I know that we can because we have. So I just wanna say congratulations. All right. Yeah, thank you, Julia. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to add too that, and this has been a really a good discussion. I I think it's been very helpful. Uh, Phil and uh, David and I go back, I think, longer than anybody else on the board, and then Julia came along shortly thereafter. So uh, we've had a chance to to observe over the last several years, and I can tell you, uh, with without trying to be. Uh, obviously critical of prior leadership, things are considerably different now in a very positive way. Uh, what we're talking about, what we're talking about occurring is a culture change. I mean, we're talking about the change of culture. Uh, that doesn't come easy uh, in the business world, and it certainly doesn't come easy in the world of higher education. And uh, we've accomplished so much in, in, in increasing our research and in, uh, in uh, eliminating some of the weaknesses in so far as issues involving deans, faculty uh, and the like. And as been, has been pointed out by the questions, we have a way to go. But for those of, those of us who have been here, I can tell you it is dramatically different than it was a few years ago. And I applaud Dr. Choi 
and our chancellors who are all listening, I hope, uh, for their efforts in helping bring this about. So can I add, we have one, thank you very much, uh, curators. We have one more presentation that I would like to ask the chair, uh, Chair Chapman and Vice Chair Holbrock to close us out with some uh, closing thoughts. Uh, but it really is the work of the faculty. We do have many great faculty members who are contributing and uh, we will work on to ensure that faculty members who can contribute more uh, do contribute more. So with that, Let's go to the last but not least presentation with uh, Provost Marie Mora and Vice Chancellor Chris Spillings. Great, thank you, President Choi. And I greatly appreciate uh, the Board of Curators for allowing me to present today. Uh, so I'll be presenting uh, on behalf of the University of Missouri St. Louis. Uh, Chris Spilling is also here on the panel and we'll be able to fill in details as we need them. Um, these are some of the topics I'll be covering, but we can, in the interest of time, move to the next slide. Um, as we've been discussing, uh, we have been taking, uh, we at the University of Missouri St. Louis have been taking a look also at where we fall relative to our peers um, with respect to different metrics, uh, one of them being uh, the federal research and development expenditures. Uh, and we can see that we do have uh, some work uh, to do uh, in terms of moving forward. Um, at the same time, it's a little bit hard to see on the slide, but we have been uh, improving in terms of uh, our federal R&D expenditures. Um, I also wanna point out this is total expenditures up through 2019 um, and does not adjust on the basis of a per capita or, or per faculty member. Uh, these are total expenditures and some of the other institutions in our peers are considerably larger in terms of faculty. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a similar uh, picture in terms of our overall uh, research and uh, development expenditures. The previous one was just for federal. Uh, and we can go ahead again in interest of time. Next slide, please. Um, we have some breakdowns uh, and I apologize for the very small uh, font here. Uh, when we copied the table into the slides, uh, it, it kept the font very, very small. Uh, but what this is showing us is that in recent years, we've had an increase in our federal uh, R&D expenditures um, and some, somewhat of a decline in terms of our state and local government. This is up through 2019. Um, the yellow bar there is pointing out the total external funds, so our externally supported research. Uh, and then in red, or I guess it's more pink, uh, we have our institutionally financed research and development, which had been on the decline. Um, the last year or two it has been increasing slightly, uh, and I'll talk briefly about that in a moment. Uh, one of the uh, graphs that we wanted to show, and again, I should say I'm a labor economist. I love graphs and I love data, and so this is something we wanted to present to you. Um, the blue uh, line there is showing our uh, externally funded grant expenditures, and we can see uh, that we have been increasing uh, year upon year since 2015. Uh, in 2020, we did have an effect of, of COVID. Uh, there, we lost three months of expenditures, um, and our vice chancellor for research has informed me that we would have shattered 2019, except a lot of our expenditures were on projects for the summer that had to be put on hold or suspended or, 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 or canceled altogether. Um, the bottom line, uh, in, or I should say in the red, uh, this is our number of our tenured and tenure track faculty members. And we can see since 2015, like the other institutions have experienced a decrease at this. So what we think is really telling about uh, this graph is that among our tenure and tenure track faculty members that we have, we have still been able to increase our research expenditures, which indicates an increase in the average productivity uh, of our tenure track faculty. Uh, to the point that we made strategic investments uh, this past year to hire a new faculty. So we had an increase on net in the first, for the first time in several years. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of some of the other research and creative measures, uh, the metrics that we look at, uh, the, again, comparing to our peers, these are on a per faculty basis. So thinking about these on average, um, we have done pretty well uh, with respect to our books and external awards. Um, we have some room to grow in terms of our journal articles as well as citations. Next slide, please. Uh, when I came on board to the University of Missouri St. Louis, um, I started in 2019. Uh, before I uh, applied for the position, I did take a, a close look at our strategic plan and I was very excited what the University of Missouri St. Louis was doing. Uh, one component is about research excellence. Uh, so we have excellence in our research and creative works. Um, and this gives you an idea of our strategic plan goals uh, from our 2018 uh, strategic plan. We have been implementing a variety of initiatives as a result to help us meet these goals, which I'll talk about here in a moment. But I won't read these, I'll give you just a second to, uh, to look at these goals. 
Next slide, please. So some of the investments we've been making, and again, we're seeing uh, some of the actual payoff in terms of the uh, additional research expenditures that we have been able to generate. Um, a very key thing that happened a couple of years ago was the realignment uh, of our FNA, basically our, our indirect costs uh, from these externally funded, uh, uh, externally funded uh, grants. Um, the restructuring actually put a bigger percentage in our Office of Research Administration um, one of the reasons we wanted to do that was to be able to provide more support for faculty across the entire institution in terms of generating more research. So as a result, uh, we have startup packages for all of our tenure track faculty. Um, this helps us be more competitive uh, when we're recruiting and also helps our new faculty as they come on board, be able to hit the ground running because they have resources that they need when they walk in the door. Uh, we have a very vibrant uh, early career research network. So we've heard some discussions about the importance of changing culture. Um, one of the ways we can change culture is to engage our excited and fantastic junior faculty uh, in terms of networking them uh, with their colleagues across campus. And one of the outcomes of this is having a junior faculty research symposium. Again, keeping our faculty engaged and shifting the culture to be more celebratory uh, and cultivating of research opportunities. In addition, uh, we were very pleased last year to uh, uh, create some programs designed for our mid-career faculty. So think about faculty who have been recently tenured or they've been, in the ten they've been tenured for some time uh, to essentially pivot them and get them back into the research mode. Uh, we have our mid-career research enhancement program uh, out of our Office of Research. Complementing that uh, is an associate to full program uh, that is designed to help our mid-career faculty rethink uh, their research, but also their teaching and service activities. Um, we got a little bit of press from that last year. That's the, the top picture that we have there with our now chancellor. Um, UMSL, UMSL led the way in terms of our research enabled uh, partnerships that was mentioned in previous, uh, so, uh, previous slides or previous presentations. Academic analytics, uh, all of our campuses are using this extremely valuable tool uh, in terms of giving us benchmarks uh, and a way for us to measure how we're doing relative to our peers. Uh, not just within the University of Missouri system, uh, but across, the, uh, across uh, the landscape of higher education. Other research support that we have out of our Office of Research uh, deals with uh, proposal development. Uh, we have program officers visits. Um, in fact, a week from tomorrow, we have some NSF uh, program, program officers who will be meeting with our new faculty. Um, and again, really trying to shift the culture to be more of one uh, that celebrates uh, and generates research. Uh, another initiative we have is strategic hiring, and we've heard that from a couple of the other campuses, so we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. Um, this is one example, and so I mentioned that we did bring on new faculty on board starting in fall 2020 in the middle of the pandemic, um, but we were taking a close look at our areas of growth, strength, and excellence, uh, and like we've heard from other campuses, um, we are looking at doing some cluster hiring around our areas of excellence, um, and one of our areas of excellence has to do with uh, opioid addiction. Uh, and looking at addiction research. And so we brought four new faculty on board. We, you can see them here. We have Devin Banks, Ryan Carpenter, Chelsea Wilkes, and Hannah White, uh, who have hit the ground running. Uh, they're already submitting grant proposals. They're collaborating with other uh, colleagues across campus, including our Missouri Institute for Mental Health. Um, they're also collaborating with candidates, uh, I'm sorry, candidates, uh, colleagues uh, at some of the other University of Missouri universities. Uh, and so we're very excited about these types of initiatives. Next slide, please. We think another one of the reasons that we've been successful in trying to turn the page uh, and shift the culture in terms of research has to do with the high degree of collaboration uh, that we have among our senior administration. We have weekly cabinet, uh, chancellor's cabinet meetings, if not more than weekly. Um, I also, as provost, have frequent meetings uh, with our vice chancellor for research um, when we collaborate and talk about how we can better support our faculty on the research side. Um, and again, one of the outcomes of that is our, our new support that we have for mid-career faculty. In addition, some of our members of senior administration uh, are leading uh, efforts in order uh, to generate more external funding. Uh, for example, uh, in October, we launched uh, our NSF Advance Program. Uh, this is a program geared toward looking at and helping women faculty in STEM and the social sciences be more successful um, with a, a special focus paid to our African-American and, and Latina faculty. Uh, the PI on that grant is our chancellor. I'm the, the lead co-PI and project director on advance. Um, we have the advanced program housed in academic affairs so that we can ensure that the initiatives that come out of advance will affect camp, uh, faculty campus-wide. Uh, we also have research enabled, uh, which uh, was uh, 
uh, jump started with a, a grant on which our vice chancellor for research, Chris Spilling, uh, is the PI on that, uh, coming from the Economic Development Administration, the US Department of Commerce. We have also a $1.3 million grant, and this just kicked off also last fall. And we were had a very good last fall uh, from uh, that is led by our assistant provost, Dr. Natisha Small uh, from the US Department of Education. Uh, and so we feel that by leading at the top, uh, we are able to make inroads in terms of affecting the culture uh, for the research on our campus. This is my last slide. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, thinking of faculty workload and what some of our next steps will be. Um, as has been discussed in some of our uh, other campuses, as well as through the curators discussion points, um, academic units are, are able to give course releases for faculty who are active uh, in research, uh, scholarly and creative works. This year, uh, given the budgetary implications from COVID, I increased the teaching load for tenured faculty uh, across our campus. Those who were highly engaged in research could request course exemptions, which were granted. Moving forward, we need to have a better way uh, to be able to identify and define what we mean by being highly research active. We have some fantastic researchers on, on our campus and we want to certainly encourage them to continue to be successful in their endeavors. Having academic analytics uh, is very useful, but we need to take a deeper dive in terms of what is the impact uh, of our research and creative works. That's a particularly important for institutions like the University of Missouri St. Louis, uh, where we have an institutional mission to transform lives. So we transform lives. Uh, and that does mean that we look at how we are placed in terms of our environment of the St. Louis region. Uh, we are the largest public urban research institution in the, re in the region. And so it's more than just generating these, uh, the, the research. We wanna see what the impact of that is. So this is one of the areas we think, for example, with the opioid research, uh, that does have direct implications and impacts for the St. Louis region and also for the great state of Missouri. Um, we need more accountability, and that it's actually been the theme of part of today's discussion is looking at you know, our faculty review processes. What do we have for tenure and promotion, annual evaluations, post-tenure reviews, and how can we put more accountability into these review processes to ensure that faculty are meeting uh, what is expected in terms of uh, the research and creative works. And then again, as been, has been discussed by some of the other campuses, uh, we are taking a close look at our, our workload guidelines uh, to keep the investments in our faculty highly engaged in research, um, at the same time uh, putting uh, additional or, or shifting some of the workload toward more teaching activities uh, for those who may not be uh, as engaged in research. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Mora. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, why don't I turn it over to Chair Chapman and then to uh, Vice Chair Hobrock. All right, well, we were very thankful for those presentations. I think they were very informative. It seems obvious that um, you guys have made a lot of progress or we as a, as a system have made a lot of progress in our research over the past few years. We're very um, pleased with that. However, we have more work to do. I think everyone has said that we have a lot more work to do, but we are on the right trajectory and we need to really um, or continue to um, challenge ourselves um, as we have done over the past few years to make those improvements. We need to accelerate that trajectory and make investments in key areas. You know, that's important. I've, I heard that repeatedly. We need to stop investing in others. Um, and we have to hold people accountable. I think I heard each one of you say that. And I think to keep this trend moving forward and to accelerate um, the research productivity, we have to do all those things. And, and like I said, I really appreciate, and I think the board appreciates the progress we've made over the last few years, but, but let's just continue to challenge ourselves and move things forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to compliment some of my curators that reminded me in their statements, uh, Julia and, and, and Marcy, about the progress you have made over, over the last five years. And it, uh, it has not gone on notice, even though sometimes I'm a little bit hard about stuff because I, I want the best for everybody every day. Um, and I want to say thank you for everybody that, that contributed and, and made the progress we've made. Uh, but I also want you guys, to all of you understand that I will still keep pushing hard for better excellence to mm -hmm. find a way. I will push hard to find the money to do the research. Um, and, uh, and everything we do going forward is about making this university and all four campuses uh, the best they can be and the best in the nation uh, to reach those levels of number one 
as opposed to number 105. So um, I am proud of this university. I am proud of what everybody has done. You guys have done a great job uh, and thank you. Um, but I will reiterate that I will keep pushing and because I, I know that we can be the greatest and, and, and thank each and every one of you. Uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, the board has been pushing at least for the past six to seven years. And uh, we appreciate the focus on achieving excellence because this state deserves four great research universities. And, and the faculty members and students and staff that contribute to achieving excellence deserve to have their uh, performance be recognized. But there is more work to do and everyone has to contribute. And each one of us, whether curators or president or a faculty are held to account to achieve the objectives. So I really do appreciate this candid discussion, direct discussion about research. And as I said, this is a watershed moment. We're gonna look back and say in 2021, we reconfirmed as a board, as a university, that excellence is expected, that requires hard work by all of us, but that investments are also required. So with that, let me ask if there are any other curators that would like to ask some comments before we close this uh, strategic theme discussion. If not, thank you so much. This has been a very uh, invigorating day intellectually. So thank you. And uh, we hope to see you soon. All right, thanks everyone. So moving on um, to the good and welfare of the board. Are there any items for the good and welfare of the board? Okay, hearing none, I would, I would now entertain a motion from the board to go into executive session. So um, moved. Second. Okay, Cindy, please call the roll. Curator Burnsick. Curator Burnsick. Yes, sorry, I was I was muted. I was double muted, then single muted, and finally unmuted all of it. All right, thank you. Curator Chapman. Yes. Curator Graham. Yes. Curator Holbrock. Yes. Curator Lehman. Yes. Curator Snowden. Yes. Curator Steelman. Yes. Curator Winokur. Yes. And Curator Williams. Yes. All right, we have all votes in favor. All right, this concludes the public session for today's meeting. Again, the board thanks everyone for their report.